Uh, yes, good evening. I, I've been here since 2011. I've been doing adult rheumatology. Um, I don't do pediatric rheumatology, didn't train in that. Um, but there are a paucity of pediatric rheumatologists in America. And uh, for kids up here, I've done a little bit of when they've gone to a pediatric rheumatologist to get started, I'll sort of follow them afterwards. Um, as rheumatology, I take care of diseases, mostly arthritis. Um, I don't do the surgery part. That's for the orthopedic surgeons, and they do the joint replacements. And that, that technology has come just phenomenally um, far in my career and, and works really well. Hips, knees, and shoulders are great now. One day we'll be great at other things, I'm sure. But, but that's really come far. I, I hopefully try to minimize the, the uh, people who need that. And based on some new drugs that we got um, back in starting in about 1998, um, we've made really great strides in reducing the number of people with rheumatoid arthritis who go on to need joint replacements. Uh, fairly dramatic drop in the number of people needing that surgery with that. Um, however, uh, as the population ages, there are ever more people getting um, total joint replacements for worn out hips and knees. So the total number of surgeries goes up, um, the cost goes dramatically up, um, but at least in, in rheumatoid arthritis, we've made real progress eliminating the need for that. Um, what is arthritis? Arthritis, the word basically broken down, arth is joint, um, itis is, is inflammation, bronchitis is inflammation of your airways, uh, dermatitis, inflammation of your skin, arthritis is inflammation of the joints. Um, not all arthritis, at least, is primarily inflammation of the joints. Probably the majority of people who have arthritis um, have wear and tear arthritis. The fancy word for that is osteoarthritis. Uh, it involves the cartilage that, that uh, lines the ball at the end of each joint just wearing thin over time. And when it gets too thin, it's finally just bone grinding bone there, and it hurts, and it can swell. And there is a little reactive inflammation there as you sort of shear off uh, what would be sawdust in the, in the wood shop. Um, the little pieces of, of damaged tissue fall apart, and, and there's an inflammatory reaction to sort of clean them up and get rid of them. But the primary condition is almost certainly um, that it just wore out. Uh, there is almost certainly uh, a genetic component. Um, it certainly runs in families, not just in general, but in which joints tend to get affected within families. Um, there are a number of known bone and cartilage diseases that put people at more risk for it. Uh, in general, people who did really hard work on, um, that, that put excessive wear on a given joint uh, tend to wear that out more commonly. Uh, although, in fairness, uh, a lot of activity, for instance, jogging, there was always the controversy, does that wear out your hips and knees? Uh, you probably, by, by exercising the muscles and the ligaments around the joints and strengthening them, that acts as a shock absorber and sort of decompresses the amount of force that has to go across the joint. So it, it actually is a little bit protective. And in the big scheme of things, uh, runners are just fine. Uh, and they don't need a lot more than anybody else. Um, let's see. So I, I deal with, with those, all the diseases. that uh, People often call arthritis rheumatism. Um, there is a specific kind of arthritis called rheumatoid arthritis, um, but everybody just talks in general about rheumatism. Again, by far the most common form of rheumatism is the worn out, the osteoarthritis. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of try to break a little bit about what, what's different uh, about these things. Osteoarthritis is really common. Uh, there are some joints that tend to get more affected than others, although anything can be affected. In some people, it's the, the bones, the joints of the spine. Um, in many, many people, it's the hips and the knees. Um, it, people get it in the fingers, um, sometimes uh, badly and not easily explained by that wearing out force. It's hard, hard to sort of imagine what about those joints cause them to wear out, but it does. Uh, Unfortunately, for this most common arthritis, I don't really have much up my sleeve. Um, we have a variety of pain medications to sort of help. Uh, the ones that were really popular about the time I started training um, were the ones that are in this group called NSAIDs, NSAIDs, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, they're all derived based from aspirin as the starting um, chemical. 
not chemically built from aspirin, but they work like aspirin did. Um, they all inhibit one component of the inflammation. They all are analgesic and pain relieving. Um, a number of them have, uh, most of the ones from when I started went generic and went over the counter. You might be familiar with brands like Advil and Aleve and, and the generic pills are those that are available. All of those are potentially pain relieving, can help with that little bit of, of reactive inflammation, cleaning up the damage in a damaged joint, and none of them prevent the progress. The, the joint will continue to wear out as if you were taking nothing while it feels better, um, but it does allow you to re remain more comfortable and potentially more active. A few years back, there was a um, scandalous problem with the drug Vioxx um, causing heart attacks. The statistics of that were very creative to say it caused heart attacks and, and um, many don't believe. After that, basically um, playing with the same sort of st statistical games, um, they decided that virtually every one of those medications could be associated with increased risk of stroke, heart attack, and other cardiovascular events. So taking any of those medications um, potentially does that. Uh, if you trade that against the risk of sitting in a chair all day because it hurts to get up and walk, I think there's a personal decision about what, what risks you'd like to take. Um, it, obviously, tons of those medications are still uh, sold and taken every day. Uh, there is no uh, medication, no approach right now to prevent the wear and tear. Um, some wear and tear comes from excessive injury when you're younger. Um, nobody would question the football player that had his, or the hockey player who had his knee blown out five or six times uh, in his high school and college days. It's going to wear out that knee way ahead of everybody else. Um, other injuries, people who have dropped something on their foot, after the damage heals, the mechanics are probably just not right anymore. And just like a, a tire on your car that's out of alignment, when the joints are out of alignment, they just wear out ahead of their time. Um, so those kinds of things can lead to it being worn out faster. In terms of a drug that would prevent that, there have been tons. Um, we have looked, I told you there's some inherited trait. Um, there look to be many, many, many different genes that might be involved in, in developing the wear and tear arthritis. Uh, there is not a, a single fix to that. There has not been a single drug that's been shown to be effective at preventing it. For any of the, um, the folks who take one of the drugs like Fosamax for osteoporosis, uh, one of the studies of Fosamax completed just before it went off patent. Um, looking back at the, the, the women who'd taken it starting in the clinical trials to get the drug approved to be on the market, they, they gave those people, they said, thanks for being our, our research subjects that got us on the market and made us a bucket of money. Um, and, and we would like to thank you by giving you a supply of this drug as long as you and your doctor think you need to take it. And, and they followed them then for 10 years of taking the medication. And they did see that the women who took the, the drug for um, fracture prevention and continued it the whole time had fewer fractures than those who didn't. They also interestingly saw that those women had less wear and tear arthritis than the women who didn't. Um, there's a little bit of logic behind why that might be true. If as you um, wear the cartilage thin, it starts to produce toxins from the cells that come in to clean up the damage, those inflammatory cells, those toxins might make the bone underneath the cartilage sicker, and they might get weaker and allow the bone to flatten sooner than it should, and that flattened surface might be like your tire out of alignment. It might no longer um, work smoothly and might wear out faster. It's a great story. The FDA would never approve the drug to be given for that purpose on, on a great story. Um, to be able to, to market the drug to prevent um, osteoarthritis, the company would have had to go back and design a trial that said, does it really um, improve osteoarthritis, prevent osteoarthritis? What are the things that might have tricked us into thinking it did when it really didn't? We'll have to address those in a new study, do another study for five or 10 years, and, and then if it, it, it confirms the, our initial observation, we'll be allowed to advertise and sell these drugs to prevent osteoarthritis. But the patent was expired. And um, no drug company invests in uh, that kind of money on a drug that's gonna be generic. They would never recover the research, and so they didn't. 
Um, just in the past year, there was an, a report looking at a couple of other of these drugs. There's about a half dozen drugs in the same class that came out to compete with Fosamax that says, hey, it looks like this might really be true. Again, very nice and very interesting. If you um, need one of those osteoporosis drugs to prevent fractures in yourself, uh, it probably, uh, I would say probably, might help you not get as bad of osteoarthritis. If you don't need it for some other reason, I wouldn't recommend anybody take it because this could all be just a fluke. We've been fooled before. Um, not necessarily intentionally. Sometimes there are honest mistakes made that make you think you saw something you didn't. Um, but that's about as close as we've come. There's a couple of other salts, I believe, a couple of years ago at the bone meetings. There was some excitement about, I think it was a strontium salt. I think at the time strontium was the salt put in the um, Sensodyne toothpaste to not make your teeth tender. Um, there's been nothing since. Typically, once you see something, it takes 10 years for it to get to the market. Um, as of today, there's, there's nothing I can tell you. Um, use good mechanics, uh, stay active and keep joints strong, and, and that's probably as good as you can do. Um, and that's unfortunately for the most, uh, the most people with arthritis. There's a, a, a large group of people who have what we would call inflammatory arthritis, is the joints are actually inflamed. Uh, in most cases, the immune system seems to be attacking the joint and causing the inflammation. Um, inflamed tissues become warm and red and swollen and very often tender and painful and even stiff. Um, and there are a number of arthritis diseases that could do that. The one that most people probably think of is rheumatoid arthritis which I think I wasn't around, I think is the, the root of rheumatism. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is a specific disease where the joints become attacked, um, it, most commonly onset in 30 to 50 year old women, but can hit anybody including children and, and older people. Uh, the inflammation in the joint becomes so intense that it literally eats away the cartilage and then eats away the bones and uh, the ligaments around the joint are often weakened, and if you know someone with rheumatoid arthritis, you may see their hands, the fingers almost slide off their hands. Um, progressive damaging disease, and when I started, um, there was really virtually nothing we could do to stop it. Um, we gave all sorts of drugs that affect the immune system, a number that were sort of stolen from cancer chemotherapy because they suppressed the immune system during cancer treatments. Uh, some other ones that were just done by, we observe, for instance, that missionaries going to Africa who took the, um, the quinine drugs for malaria prevention, their arthritis got better sometimes. And one of those drugs is used to this day to, to, as a sort of weak um, rheumatoid arthritis inhibitor. Uh, and, and we frankly didn't see much improvement with the drugs back then. Uh, almost never did we see the arthritis sort of halt. Um, and it led, uh, without, without something to prevent it, it just marches forward until the joints are destroyed and the patient's disabled. Not uncommonly um, in the prime years of, of young women's life, they would just sort of um, have kids, uh, raise the kids and get ready to go back to work just about the time the disease onset and within a couple of years they were on disability. And we really had very little to stop back then. I'll talk a little bit more in, uh, before the end about some medications we've gotten since 1998 that for many people with that disease, it, we can almost turn it off. Um, it, it's really changed. There's a, no, a number of other diseases that involve inflammations of the joint. Uh, one of the most common and the ones you'll see on TV if you watch that, mm -hmm. uh, is psoriatic arthritis. The skin disease, psoriasis, um, a percentage of people who get the skin involvement um, get a fairly specific kind of inflammatory arthritis in their joints. It's very different than, than what happens in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it, it, looks, it looks different while it's happening, and after it does its damage, the damaged joints look different, especially little joints. Big joints like the knees just look shot. Um, but smaller joints like in your fingers really get, get a specific kind of damage from the psoriatic arthritis. Uh, again, when I started, there was very little we could do for that. The drugs, some of the drugs that, have, that work for rheumatoid arthritis have been taken over and they work great in psoriatic arthritis. There's a couple of newer drugs that work in a totally different way um, that also can really turn off psoriatic arthritis. Um, and that's pretty dramatic. They also tend to make the skin much better. 
Um, so probably whatever's wrong in the skin, and we don't to this day know what's wrong, uh, is, is somehow going wrong in the joints of those people. Your skin is your biggest immune organ. It's, it's your biggest um, defense against germs trying to get into the body. So there's tons of immune cells in there, and almost certainly the psoriasis is some reflection of a problem with the immune system, but don't ask anybody what that is. We just don't know. There's some other inflammatory arthritis. I've seen virtually all of these um, in Fairbanks. Um, one is, is a group of, of arthritis that we call spondyloarthropathies. Spondyl is spindle or spool, like, like a spool of thread. Um, your spine is a stack of spindles, and, and so the spondyloarthropathies affect the spine. Um, most uh, affect it to some degree. One almost um, terribly affects it, but they all tend to involve some measure in the spine. Psoriatic arthritis, by the way, is in the group of spondyloarthropathies. Uh, a large one in that group is, is known as reactive arthritis. It's a reaction after the body has an infection. Um, there's a couple of specific infections that can do that. The germ that causes the STD um, chlamydia that people might know about can trigger that in some people. Um, its first cousin, chlamydia pneumonia, a bug that, that doesn't affect the, the um, sexual system, but it does affect the lungs and the nose, um, it can do the same thing. Um, and presumably the immune system somehow in getting it ramped up to fight the germ becomes ramped up to, to attack your joints. And it, it can be an intense arthritis. In some people, we, we always have known since I trained, they get a, a chronic arthritis. Most people it goes away in a few weeks or a few months and it's just, huh, isn't that interesting? We, have, we believe the germ is killed at that point, but, it, but um, it, the arthritis goes on for weeks, sometimes months. In some people, the arthritis went on and on and on, either steady or sometimes getting better, getting worse, getting better, getting worse. Um, and and for my, most of my career, we just assumed that was people's immune system that couldn't figure out how to get it straight. Uh, as of 2010, in the early 2000s, we discovered ways to detect the germs from their DNA. Uh, and we, they detected that in some people, the chlamydia germ can live essentially forever in your white blood cells. And they sort of hypothesized, gosh, could that be the, the people who get the chronic arthritis? The bug wakes up every once in a while and tries to multiply them, and it does. The immune system gets all hyped up again and attacks the joints again. And as of 2010, there was a report that says that's probably true. And those people sometimes benefit from taking long terms of antibiotics. Um, and by the way, long-term antibiotics in America is as, as evil a word, a set of words as you can use together, because we've used so many antibiotics here, both to treat viral head colds, which don't benefit at all, but everybody thinks they need one, and to, to treat our livestock so that we can grow more livestock faster um, on, in less space. Uh, that we now have tons and tons of bacteria that are getting very resistant um, to all the antibiotics, including a few bugs that are, come up every once in a while, you hear about superbugs, that can basically chew up every antibiotic we have to throw at them. And, and they could become a serious threat, it's, it's true. Um, but in this particular kind of arthritis, long months of antibiotics can actually finally cure the people of arthritis. In the study I, I'm talking about, one of the people had had it for 20, 20 plus years and was cured by taking the antibiotics. Um, so it's a nice touch. Uh, there's another, a number of other inflammatory diseases. We lump these things in, in you may have heard the term autoimmune disease. Um, lots of people like to think about autoimmune. Autoimmune is simply auto like your car, it, takes, it drives itself, the automatic transmission. In, in, in the autoimmune diseases, the immune system attacks the self. And um, there are not just my diseases. I take care of uh, some arthritis that are autoimmune and a number of other diseases that are, we believe, autoimmune that aren't really primarily arthritis. But there's many diseases. Juvenile diabetes is actually autoimmune. Uh, the vast majority of people with thyroid disease, which is fairly common, uh, is autoimmune. The immune system attacks the thyroid gland. So there's a number of these diseases, and, and I take care of a few of them. Um, some, of the, some of the ones that are really commonly, at least, get a lot of press, 
Thyroid disease is very common, but it's pretty easy to take care of, so it doesn't get a lot of press. Lupus gets a lot of press. Um, and, and lupus is an is a immune disease where your immune system can attack multiple organs in the body, including the joints, the skin, the lungs, the kidneys, and on and on and on. Um, and in any one individual, it, it may a attack three or four of those and leave the rest alone. In fact, lupus might be a syndrome and not one disease. It might be the syndrome of your immune system attacking organs, but there's multiple different diseases. And that's been around for 30 years, and we're not any better telling you that either. Um, but in, in, in disease lupus, the immune system can attack a number of, gland, of, of, of glands and organs in the body. And we finally uh, have a fairly effective treatment for that. Just a few years ago, um, there's finally a, a new drug in the same general class as the kinds of immune-changing drugs that we use for rheumatoid arthritis now that I told you about. Um, phenomenally expensive, $30,000, $40,000 a year. But it's, it's got the ability to really turn off this terrible disease, lupus. Um, there's, there's also a group of diseases that we call vasculitis um, because they, they cause inflammation, there's that itis, in the vascular system, in the arteries and the veins. Um, and it, this inflammation can be trivial and can cause a red spot on your leg, or it can be severe and cause you to have strokes and, and um, heart attacks. Um, and probably can damage the big arteries like the aorta enough that the thing falls apart and you know how long you live with that. Um, so the vascular diseases are the immune system uh, causing the blood vessels themselves to be attacked. Uh, magically, one of my fancy drugs for rheumatoid arthritis also has been found to be very good at turning off the immune system as it attacks that. So we've finally got some very effective. We had some old cancer chemotherapy drugs that turned that off, and in the days I trained, um, we often saw that our, our drugs, uh, cytoxan, which is essentially um, nitrogen mustard in, in a drug, um, that powerfully um, suppresses the immune system. We could turn off the disease so they survive from the, the vasculitis, and then they would die from the opportunistic infections that they got because their immune system was so suppressed, um, which is not really a good trade-off. <laughs> Just recently, we've gotten some, some really good drugs that are effective and have very few side effects and can really help that. Um, again, in that um, outrageously expensive group of drugs. Um, there's a number of, of kinds of arthritis that, that are related to infection. Uh, at the simplest level, um, infection, common infections like staph and strep will sometimes get into joints. If you don't get that addressed and treated very quickly, you can lose the joint. It will, the, the, the inflammation, which is probably largely um, the damage caused by the immune cells that, that migrate into the joint to fight the infection, releasing their poisons to kill the germs, probably kill most of the joint cells and do a lot of the damage. Um, but if you don't get it treated very quickly, get on antibiotics, sometimes need to have the joint flushed out by the orthopedic surgeon in the operating room, um, the joint just fuses in, into a solid, um, not, no longer a joint. Um, and, and almost any bacteria can do that, but the ones that commonly give people infections are the most common ones to get it in the joint. So staph and strep are, are really common. You, you've almost probably all, I hope, heard of Lyme disease. Um, not much of a problem up in Alaska. There have been a few cases. Um, so far, every one of those cases of Lyme disease was somebody who got it in the lower 48 and, um, and brought it up here, came up here with it. Um, there's not, as far as, as I'm aware, a case that actually was, was somebody who was bitten by a tick here. But that was the disease that wasn't even recognized until just a little over 30 years ago. Um, the people were just in the group of sort of ununderstood, non-understood arthritis. Don't know why, he's just got it. Um, and it, in fact, it was discovered in kids who had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis in kids. Um, it was called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. When I trained, that was kind of a lumpers diagnosis. All kinds of arthritis were just lumped into JRA. There's been a lot of splitting since then, and we know some of those kids really have adult rheumatoid arthritis. Some of them have lupus. Some of them have psoriatic arthritis as kids. Um, but a subset that had a, a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis in the town of Old Lyme, Connecticut, um, 
their mothers were just upset that there were too many cases of this supposedly, if not rare, at least uncommon childhood disease. And when they finally convinced the, the health officials to look into it, they discovered that it was a germ and the germ was carried by ticks and um, it could be cured with an antibiotic. And, and now we know the CDC reports something like average of 10,000 cases of Lyme disease a year in the lower 48. Um, and it is not a new germ. It was here when Christopher Columbus got here. It's just that we didn't know the germ existed. Nobody had discovered that bacteria. There was no test for it, and so it couldn't be a disease. Um, and, and I've seen a handful of cases up here. I've also seen some people who seem to have um, an infection that might be related to Lyme disease. Um, there are, since we discovered the Lyme germ, we've discovered about a dozen cousins to the Lyme bacteria. Um, the Lyme germ that causes the disease in, in the lower 48, which can be an arthritis, it can also affect your heart or your brain, and it gives you a very classic skin rash in, in many people. Um, it, that, that bacteria is not present in Europe. They, just, they have two different cousins of that germ that cause uh, Lyme disease there. It's much more common to get into the brain in, in Europe than it is here, the different bacteria. Um, and, and parenthetically, the blood test that you use to test for Lyme disease in, in Europe won't detect American Lyme disease, nor will our blood test, our commercial blood test for Lyme disease detect their germ. Um, they, they're different germs. And um, of course, that couldn't be a problem because you've never heard anybody who went, hit, you know, never heard of an American who went hiking through Europe or anything, right? I mean, why would we need that? You can actually get it via the health department. They, there, there are ways to get the test done, but it's just not a standard test. There's a number of other tick-borne bacteria um, and, and some tick-borne viruses as well, but they don't cause arthritis, at least as far as we know. There's some other tick-borne uh, bacteria that cause illness, um, some that were thought to not really be human pathogens until we had a bunch of Lyme patients and, could, and figured out that we could cure their Lyme disease, but they were still sick, and then we picked up that they were carrying these other bacteria. Um, so there's a number of, of bugs that, that do that. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of ticks in Alaska. Um, when I first got here, people told me that the ticks can't survive the cold here. <laughs> um, of course they can. They've had a long time to learn how to do it. Um, nobody would say that in Wisconsin where it gets virtually as cold as it does in the interior of Alaska. Um, maybe not as long. Um, and and the, there are ticks here. There are ticks on some of the rodents that they know about and they do carry a different disease called tularemia um, in Alaska. There's a tick that, that I think the, um, the state wildlife people are scared to death of, a moose tick um, that infests moose to the point that they get, their skin becomes so irritated they scratch their fur off on trees and come winter they don't do well. Um, and, and that isn't here. It's in Canada, it's in Maine, but it hasn't gotten here, but they're worried. But we do have ticks, and, and potentially there could be tick-borne illnesses here, um, besides tularemia that you don't hear a lot about. We don't have a lot of that here. Um, and maybe we'll learn about that one day. Um, as it stands, there's not a ton of research being done to look, look for um, tick-borne illnesses. Without a bunch of research money, nobody's interested in looking for it. Um, university researchers depend on having grant money to fund this sort of thing. And uh, so we're not making a, a rapid progress there, but that's another sort of arthritis. So um, I, I mentioned, that, oh, I, I, I treat other kinds of musculoskeletal problems that aren't in the joints. I treat diseases that affect the muscles. Um, some of those are the immune system attacking the muscles. There's a couple of varieties of that. Um, and I, I've certainly seen that in this town. Um, I treat other bone diseases like osteoporosis, um, which is very common. Um, rheumatologists like myself, when I went into practice, um, commonly were guilty of adding to osteoporosis and making it worse because one of the few drugs we had to treat uh, people's arthritis back then were prednisone or related steroids that can make you feel better, can make you more functional, but just eat away your bones. And osteoporosis was a much worse disease back then. Um, but I, I, I take care of that. It's, it's some of the, in, in towns where there's a lot of endocrinology, the endocrinologists often take care of that. Um, there's not a lot of endocrinology in Fairbanks, and so um, I've done a fair amount of that. Um, 
And then there, there's a number of genetic muscle diseases, um, the muscular dystrophy kind of things. I will admit, I don't, I don't think I've seen that here. I saw that more in Baltimore, although I tended to refer those patients down to Hopkins where they have a very large neuromuscular group. Um, but I, I do take care of them to the extent that would, would be needed. Uh, I alluded to treatments. Um, and again, for, for the most common arthritis, the wear and tear arthritis, I've got, I've got symptomatic pain relief. Um, that's Tylenol, which, which was for a long time argued to be the best and safest drug. Then Tylenol got that reputation of killing your liver. Um, gosh, there's nothing safe that you can put in your mouth, really. Um, for many people, Tylenol isn't just, it's just isn't strong enough, but for some it is, and, and, and so it's worth a try. Um, the, about the time I went into practice, there was a big argument from the academic rheumatologist that we should quit giving people the Motrin, Naproxen, NSAID drugs, those non-steroidals, um, because the risk of stomach ulcer was just too great. They weren't thought to cause heart attacks back then. Um, and they do cause a fair number of stomach ulcers, but again, the person deciding, do I want to sit in a chair all day or do I want to get up and risk having an ulcer, many people decided they'd rather take the chance at having an ulcer. Um, there are other pain uh, medicines. Um, opiates became vastly overused in the last few years. Honestly, when I trained, um, the philosophy was never to use any opiate drug for arthritis. They were considered to be great painkillers for acute pain. So if you, if you had trauma, if you fell and broke something, <clears throat> great painkiller. If you had surgery, which is trauma to the tissues that are cut on, um, again, great painkillers. If you had cancer with, with metastases to places that caused lots of pain, and it can be excruciatingly painful, um, opiates were great drugs. All of those pain sources are going to improve in a short amount of time. Um, either you're going to heal from the trauma or the surgery, um, and your cancer is going to get better, or your cancer is not going to get better, and you won't need to use the opiate long term, so it wasn't a threat. All my arthritis diseases you're going to have to today and tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month and next year, and when you use opiates very long term like that, the body has a natural mechanism to become less sensitive to the opiates, so you need more and more. It was true with heroin users, it's true with all of the um, prescription opiates. Um, so that just to get pain relief, you have to take more and more. And finally, just to not go through withdrawal, you had to take more and more. Unfortunately for America, a very powerful marketing company took over one of the um, opiate drugs back in the 90s and um, marketed not so much to the public and to doctors back then as to politicians, convincing them that doctors under-treated pain and we weren't <coughs> prescribing enough of the opiates. And the heavy hand of the government regulators told us we needed to prescribe more of these drugs. And now, 30 years later, they're astonished that America has a problem with tons of people um, hooked on the opiates and overdosing on the opiates. Um, I'm still a believer that the opiates are a poor choice for most people with chronic arthritis pain, um, and, and I don't use those. I left out, I, one of those kinds of inflammatory arthritis is gout, by the way, which is an, also a very common arthritis, um, can be very disabling to people, um, causes tons of, um, of lost work days, which is uh, painful to the employer who misses his good employee. After a time when sick leave is used up, is painful to the employee who's off work. Um, very painful to the, to the self-employed person who eats both sides of that. Um, and I have drugs that can virtually cure the vast majority of people with gout. Um, gout is something that, that nobody needs to live with long term, just about. Um, that, and, and those are not the phenomenally expensive drugs. Those are pretty straightforward drugs. We understand how it happens. We know what to do to fix it, and the drugs are now, most of them, generic. So we can fix that. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, I told you when I started, you know, I sat down with a 35-year-old school teacher who'd just gone back to work and, you know, comes in with horrible arthritis. Everything inflamed, very rapidly progressing. And I would sit and try to be reassuring while I was thinking to myself, wow, you're going to be disabled in five years, you know, this is, and there's nothing I can do. Um, I can't tell you that because you're already in shock, but it was pretty awful and we really didn't have effective treatments. Um, and in, in 1998, one of the first biologics that really works well, you may have seen it advertised on TV, Embryo hit the market. 
And it's one of those drugs derived from searching from, for um, anti-cancer immune chemicals. Um, and it turns out it, it will kill cancer cells at a dose that kills the patient first, so it's not really effective for cancer. When they ask what does it really do, the answer is it's sort of a riot hormone for the immune system. When the immune system thinks it needs to call in its buddies for a fight, um, it releases this chemical and, and tissues become very inflamed with all the immune cells. And it turns out that chemical is very involved in rheumatoid arthritis and in several other arthritises. And when they develop drugs that block that, that immune message, the, the inflammation just goes away. And um, for many patients now with rheumatoid arthritis don't even really know they have arthritis. They're, they're in, in very low disease activity, we call it, but most people would think of it as remission. Um, and that's, that's sort of an achievable goal for a lot of patients, not for everybody, but for a lot. Um, there are a half dozen drugs that work the, on the exact same immune chemical. There are finally, as the patents have expired for those chemicals, um, the, the chemicals, the, the particular drugs, are actually monoclonal antibodies. They are antibodies are the proteins your immune system makes to, to fight invading germs. Um, we've learned how to, to harness that and to get a single pure antibody that happens to target something we want to target. And we've got drugs that will target this immune chemical that causes inflammation. Um, they're very complicated proteins. Um, and making them the way you make generic aspirin just doesn't fly. Um, we've gotten around to approving a group of drugs that we're going to call biosimilar. They're similar chemicals biologically, and the government's anxious to get them on the market because they're potentially much cheaper than the branded drugs. And those are just hitting the market in, in, in the U.S. We have a couple of those now. Um, these drugs started in 98 at about $10,000 a year. Um, they all have to be injected into your body somehow. They're proteins, so if you took them by mouth, the stomach would treat them like a steak and just digest them. Um, they have to be injected somehow directly into the body. One of those drugs for, for the, uh, this group was an intravenous drip. The other ones are all injections that you inject yourself at home with needles, um, and people became very adept at that very quickly. Um, they worked very well. They were at 10000 a year. Over time, their price is inflated to about thirty to forty thousand dollars a year now. Um, of course, no one expects the, the the patient to pay for that. The expectation is that there will be a third party payer somewhere that picks up the tab for that. Um, and in many cases, the companies have negotiated kickbacks. I'm sorry, um, rebates <laughs> to the insurance companies, so that if an insurance company says we will turn, we will give all of our customers to you first, we, you'll be our first choice drug then you, you give us a percentage rebate at the end of the quarter on how much, however much money we spent on your drug. Um, nobody's aware these are private contracts between the, the companies, between an insurance company and a drug company. The, the, the talk is that it's probably in the range of, of 50%, but that's, that's a pure guess. Um, at any rate, it, just like the ad on TV, this is nobody pays for your retail, nobody pays for retail for these drugs. If there's a patient who has the disease, who has no insurance, that couldn't pay for the drug, the companies are very um, flexible in the way free drug. In fact, that's part of why they justify jacking the price so high, because they do give a lot of way, and I have a number of patients who take free drugs. Um, and, and, and the vast majority of people who take it, um, their cost is $5 a month or something. So despite very high prices, it's um, not so high to go. And these drugs really have changed the world of arthritis. I, I, I see that 35-year-old school teacher who is going to be disabled now who doesn't know she has arthritis anymore, who just functions as if things are normal. Um, there are a half dozen drugs that work very similar to that first one. There's another four drugs that work on a totally different immune chemical but are similar antibodies to a different immune chemical that work very well for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there are several new antibodies that work well for psoriatic arthritis um, that also are in the same price range and the same sort of thing. They have to be injected into the body somehow. Um, but they've really changed the picture for, for these diseases um, dramatically. 
Uh, hopefully we'll get some of these sorts of treatments for other um, things. The, uh, there are some cancer treatments that involve the same sort of strategy, by the way, and, and so it's not just rheumatoid arthritis drugs that do this. And there are some drugs for multiple sclerosis that work in a very similar way um, at similar prices. I mean, who would want to pay less? Um, <laughs> so so there, there is progress being made, and I think there's potential to make a lot more progress. Um, this is dramatically different than when I went into rheumatology. Um, and hopefully we'll find something someday soon to change the picture of the wear and tear arthritis, but just because it is so much more common. Um, but that's not today. All right, so that's sort of an overview. Are there any specific questions about arthritis that anybody has? Yes? What's the difference between arthritis and a first sight? What's the difference between a bursitis and an arthritis? So it, there's a lot of places in your body where things rub, uh, where, where a, a ligament or a muscle or something rubs against something else, another ligament or often a bone. And, and so to, to give you some, some lubrication and cushioning where things have to rub, you have little sacs of fluid called bursa. And, and the bursa um, are, are filled with a little jelly-like material and they're just a little cushion, a little slippery and things rub nice. But bursas can get inflamed. Um, they, they typically get inflamed from gout. That, that can cause pr pretty profound um, inflammation. They can get inflamed after um, just an overuse. Um, they get inflamed after trauma sometimes, after you bump your elbow against something really hard. Um, and they can get infected um, as well. They get staph in them sometimes in bursitis. So bursitis is inflammation of that bursa that sits next to a joint, but not the joint itself. And typically not quite as disabling, although when it really hurts, it can, it can put you down. Yes? So is Sjogren's syndrome one of the autoimmune kinds of things that can cause you inflammation? Right. So she's asked about Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, a, Danish, a Danish pathologist in the 30s, I'm sorry, I forget now, um, discovered that, that um, experimentally slicing autopsies, they don't do this to everybody. Um, <laughs> it just, who's going to die of something? The, when you slice through the salivary gland, uh, a number of people, um, it's normal to have some immune cells in the salivary gland because your mouth is full of bacteria and germs. And, and so you, your entire gut, from, from the lips to the other end, have immune cells along there to help provide some protection. The salivary glands have a bunch of immune cells that can secrete antibodies to, to help keep germs at bay, if you will, as they travel um, through the body, technically outside the body. Everything between your lips and that other end is outside of your body. Um, it's not inside the meat of the body, if you will. Um, it's open at either end, but um, you can't just get out of the body, and that's good because that stuff getting to the body would be bad for fast. Um, he discovered that there were too many immune cells in some people. And from big salary glands, he was able to actually count the number of cells and, and show statistically that some people have way too many. And symptomatically, then you go to people who get very dry mouth. And, um, and if you biopsy their salivary glands, they've got way too many immune cells in their salivary glands. And some of them have actually attacked the gland so bad that it's actually scarred up and it looks like fibrous scar tissue, not salivary gland anymore. Um, and that's Sjogren's syndrome. Um, and it, it is presumably the immune system attacking the salivary gland. It is some of those patients, and depending on which study you look at, um, um, a lot of those patients make antibodies to a very specific part of the cellular genetic reproduction system. Um, a lot of the diseases, uh, rheumatoid arthritis makes some antibodies against stuff from the body. Rheumatoid factor was the first one. There's a newer one that everybody wanted to be the savior to be better at making diagnosis um, called anti-cyclic citronated peptide. Um, but they're antibodies against the self. Diseases like lupus and scleroderma, um, where the immune system attacks the skin, we think, and the skin becomes extremely thick and people are literally like mummified in their own skin. Um, they make antibodies against very specific targets in, in the genetic reproduction system of the cell. And, and we thought that was going to tell us exactly. Obviously, this was some virus that used that particular um, genetic enzyme to reproduce. And the people had the virus, and now they make it. Well, you know, 
that story's 40 years old and we're no closer to an answer. We don't know why. But a number of these autoimmune diseases make specific antibodies against an immune reaction against a very tiny, very specific, you know, it's like, it's like um, an antibody in your car that's directed against the fifth cylinder piston ring, you know, just against that one and nothing else. Um, but, it, but it knocks your car out. Um, we don't know why they do that, but they do. And so it's presumably an autoimmune disease. Um, you get dry eyes and dry mouth. And a number of, of people have been reported to get lots of other immune phenomena and bad things happening to the body. I actually am on a couple of papers about this because I did a big medical student research project on Sjogren's while I was in training. And they used my database. I may mean, be this giant computer database of their Sjogren's patients. And every time they used it, they put my name on the paper to thank me for doing it. And so I'm on a bunch, not all I believe. But it's been blamed on causing many other immune phenomena. And it's not clear how often that is. It was thought to either be a rare disease all by itself, or more commonly it occurred along with some other autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. You would also get Sjogren's with it. Well, we recognize a lot of people get Sjogren's all by itself. Um, and, and yes, it's one of those diseases. And no, there is no treatment, including all the fancy $30,000 drugs that I've got that have consistently um, been able to help the, the Sjogren's. Uh, not with the immune, nothing with the immune attack on the salivary and tear glands. And, and people literally say, I couldn't cry, I couldn't make, make saliva. Pretty distressing, actually, to people that have it. Um, and, and we haven't been able to fix that. Um, in, in my training days, there were about a dozen brands of artificial saliva, um, and we encourage everybody to try them, and nobody ever stuck with them. They are about what you, you would use it just when you went to eat a meal. You would, you know, swig a little bit of saliva and, and <laughs> what are you laughing about? Come on. Um, nobody, nobody seemed to stick with those. Um, so, so there's not great treatment. There was a brand of pill that basically tried to make you salivate the way, you know, the Pavlov's dogs salivated when they saw a steak. Um, none of those have been very satisfying for the people that have it and, and it's still out there but it's one of those diseases. Yes? How long has methotrexate been used as um, rheumatoid arthritis um, stopper or blocker? Um, I can't tell you the first time it was tried, but it was, it, it was in pretty common use by the late 70s, um, early 80s. Um, it was not FDA approved. There was, they went through a big song and dance to, at the national arthritis meetings to say, well, it's not approved, but if you do, here's how you would use it. Um, the, the truth is there's a lot of enthusiasm again today for the drug. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm over a report a couple of years ago that said uh, it was done at the VA. It was a really poorly done mechanistic study, but it said that, that methotrexate plus a couple of other drugs like that quinine drug I told you about, hydroxychloroquine, um, that when you give those together, you can do almost as good for the rheumatoid arthritis as you can with the $30,000 a year drugs. And you can imagine there's a lot of payers uh, out there who would like to think that that's true because the methotrexate and the other drugs are cheap old generics, really cheap. Um, the truth is, you know, we tried those drugs when I was in training because we had nothing. Come on, that 35-year-old school teacher, you'd think I didn't give her everything we had up our sleeve? And they didn't work then, but magically now, um, this study says they work and there's a lot of excitement about it. Um, it, methotrexate by itself has never been able to halt the progress of the rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis before the biologic drugs, which these drugs are called biologics because the protein is made biologically. Aspirin, you take a chemical formula, you mix some of this and that, and heat it up and boil it and then you filter it. And, um, to make the biologic drugs, you put the DNA gene that describes how to build that drug into a cell line that just sits and cranks out the drug, the protein, all day long into a big vat the size of a railroad tank car, and you purify the protein out of that, out of the, the broth that the, the cells are living in. Um, so they're biologically produced. Those drugs have virtually all been shown to halt the progress of, 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 the, of the joint damage. If you do x-rays, you can just watch the joint be destroyed. Um, and when people die and the meat falls off their bones, the joints look destroyed. Um, and methotrexate, God love it, has never been able to, to be demonstrated to prevent that. The other drugs have. 
um, either with methotrexate or without it. Um, but it is a bucket load cheaper, and all of our uh, all of our third party payers would far rather at least try that um, as a, as a first case. There's a number of, of problems. Um, some people get hair loss from it. Um, some people get um, well. It, it's it's very dangerous for a fetus. So giving it to young women is who are mo of course the most common target to get rheumatoid arthritis. Giving them methotrexate is is a major problem with um, with um, getting pregnant. Um, and, and some people just get stomach upset from it, that sort of thing. Most people tolerate it pretty well. It's just that it really doesn't work well for a lot of people. And it's been around for a long time. There was somebody else. Psoriasis. Uh-huh. Psoriasis, is that a form of arthritis? Psoriasis is a skin disease. Um, and there's a handful of forms that the, that the dermatologist, the skin specialist, can sort out from psoriasis, but they're all, we think, related to the same defective mechanisms. Um, and some patients with psoriasis get arthritis, and that's psoriatic arthritis. And that's what the golfer on TV talks about all the time. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's a, it's a form. There's somebody back there for it. Disease you talked about five minutes ago, Sorgan's disease. Shrogan's, uh huh? Is that what Venus Williams has? <laughs> <laughs> That's what she has. That's what was reported. Is it she have Shrogan's? Yeah, it was reported in the paper. I can't, I can't remember what she said to have. I, 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 I mean, it just didn't register. Um, but yeah. I just wondering how she's performing at a high level because she's had it for a decade or more. Oh. The Sjogren's could be a fairly mild, like every disease, from a heart attack to a stroke to cancer, there's mild forms of disease and severe forms of disease. There's plenty of people who have a relatively dry mouth, who, who you can objectively show have evidence or immune system, but they still do perfectly fine, and they're minimally affected by the disease. So, and that's true of virtually any disease. Yes? So are there any topicals that are effective for pain, for instance, in the hands? Um, so, so let's see. When I was growing up, there was aspirin cream. Um, aspirin chemically is a huge chemical. Your skin is a very effective barrier, and aspirin doesn't cross the skin. Okay. Oh, are there topicals effective for this? Um, about uh, probably in the mid-1990s, um, the chemical that's in um, uh, red peppers. Does anybody eat really hot peppers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, jalapenos are toys. Um, there's hot peppers out there. And somebody noticed that if you eat a really hot pepper, your mouth screens in pain for a few minutes, and then it goes numb. And, and so they said, why does it go numb? And, and, and the answer is, well, capsaicin depletes this neurotransmitter chemical called substance P that's involved in getting the pain message from the receptor, wherever it is, to the brain. And if you deplete substance P, then you don't carry the pain message well. And, and the first of these, um, and, and you can't take enough capsaicin by mouth. You could put it in a capsule so that it wouldn't burn your mouth, but your intestines aren't gonna like it. Um, so you can't take enough of it internally to, to, to be a, an effective pain numbing medicine like that. But they, they first tried it in people who've had shingles that you see the ads to sell those shingles vaccines for. Um, the, the shingles, nobody would care about getting a patch of chicken pox on their hand for a week. You know, it's a pain, but you've, you've had worse. But for a third of people over the age of 60 who get shingles, they get this neuropathic pain. It originates in the nerves because that's where the shingles virus lives since you had chicken pox as a kid. Um, and it reactivates and travels down the nerve fibers to the skin where it causes the blisters. Um, you could, almost nothing treats that neuropathic pain. And so they tried the capsaicin creams on top of that, and lo and behold, it relieves the pain. Now, it took six weeks to, to soak in deep enough to, to relieve enough of the pain for many people, four times a day, which is a little bit of a trouble. But, but look, if you've got this pain and nothing relieves it, even opiates didn't relieve the, the neuropathic pain, then, then anything would be worth trying. And so the first brand on the market was called Zostrix for herpes zoster, the virus that causes chickenpox. Um, they quickly tried that on arthritis, and it does tend to work, but again, you gotta put it on four times a day. It, it can take up to six weeks before it soaks in deep enough to start working. 
and especially if you're you know, a young working person, if you're a young secretary working at a desk where you'd four times a day, you can put it on before work and then after work, but then twice a day, you gotta go roll the pantyhose down and coat your knees. I mean, it's not gonna happen. Um, and, and in fact, very few men would, you know, are gonna roll their pants up and put it on at work. So it was very, it wasn't great about that, but it's out there, it's still available. Um, for a brief time, the company that made Zostrix made, they made one that was three times as concentrated called HP Zostrix. And there's generic HPs now too, capsaicins. You don't have to buy the brands anymore. Um, and, and it was three times as concentrated, but it didn't, it didn't work better or faster. Um, Everybody liked it though, um, because it probably was stronger. Um, then they came out with one that was 10 times as strong. Um, they gave it another name, they called it Dolorac to distinguish it from the other two. Um, and it, it would, if it was gonna work, you only needed to apply it twice a day, and if it was gonna work, you'd know within two weeks. Well, I might not be able to talk you into trying this for six weeks, four times a day, but you're willing to try it twice a day for two weeks. So a lot more people found that helpful. And in the world of American industry, um, somebody bought out the company that made Zostrix, and they decided in their marketing department, we're not going to market three of these drugs. That's too much money spent on the same thing. So we'll keep the two that are called Zostrix because that's two names with just one ad. Um, we'll drop the, gosh, that's a shame, but they quit making it. And I'm not aware of a generic company that makes the 10 times concentrated stuff. Um, the nice thing is there's almost no side effects. Um, a few people who put it on said if they put their if they put it on their hand and put their hand in hot water, it felt like their skin was burning. Well, that's what it was. Joe Namath that sold Flexol 409 or something. That's all it did. Made the skin feel warm. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that's a side effect, but it was for some. If you put it on your hand and rub your eye, you'll know. Um, the company provided me with samples and nice little picture books about how to do it, just the right amount for, for a finger or a knee. Um, but, you know, and I, I gave out a lot of it to people to try first. Um, one patient finally convinced me to show her how to use it, even though I'd given her the picture book. And, and I brought it, and I knew to wash my hands, so I washed them thoroughly. And it was probably two hours later that I did this. And I knew. Now, it didn't hurt, but it felt warm. I've, uh, you know, I, I spent years in Houston and, and ate Mexican food all the time and I spent hours slicing or dicing jalapeno peppers. And after you do that, your fingers tingle for a week with the, with the capsaicin and you rub your eye and you can, it feels warm. It was sort of like that, it wasn't, but you know, that was the side effects. Otherwise it didn't cause any bad internal side effects and it's still worth a try and it's available out there. Um, and it was added to aspirin, by the way. Um, after it was shown to work. So there's actually something in aspirin cream. There's a, and there's a prescription topical, by the way, that has one of those NSAIDs in it. Um, and there are two forms, one that's just a, a water-based um, cream or gel that you rub on, one that's actually put in DMSO, the old horse liniment that was by itself very popular 15, 20 years ago. Um, and the argument is not because the DMSO helps, it's because the DMSO gets it through your skin better um, because it's hard to, um, and, and that's out there, and some people like that, but that's a prescription. Yes? Uh, quite a few uh, supplements out. Of uh, what? Supplements. Oh, yes, out supplements. That claim uh, to yes. promote healthy joint and so forth. Is sure. Is there any claim to any of it? Well, they lighten your wallet substantially. <laughs> so you don't have to carry around that heavy wallet. Um, so, so, you know, supplements, a great part of the problem is there's, there's very little research done on them, so we don't know what works if they work. Um, and, and sometimes, look, it's not because plant-based things can't be effective. Virtually every antibiotic is from a fungus. That's from the first one, penicillin, that was discovered in bread mold to, to almost all of them. They're all from plants. A lot of cancer chemotherapy drugs come from um, um, plants. There's a lot of stuff out there. The problem is if you don't know what the active ingredient is, and you don't know how much of it is good and how much of it is too much and may be bad, it's very hard to carry on a treatment with it. Um, so, so those sorts of things are tough. There's lots of things that, that advertise, carefully phrased, they provide immune support. Well, sure, but so does a, so does a steak and, and, and eggs provide immune support. Um, good nutrition provides immune support. 
showing that that nutritional extra actually makes the immune system better. Well, first of all, understand it's very difficult to prove because how do you measure immune strength? It's, it's not at all easy to, to do. Um, so it would be very hard to produce that and it's very easy to just call it a supplement, then you don't have to, to, to do the research. So there's not much research on that. Um, there have been tons of, of dietary measures over my career even that have come up that would, that would fix arthritis or the cause of, and if you just drop this from your diet, it would get better. At least on any population basis, so a large number of people, none of those has been shown to be effective. It doesn't mean that they aren't for some people, but it means they aren't for probably the masses and it would be difficult to figure out if it's for you. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin were very popular supplements, starting with a book that came out in the 90s. I was actually at a dinner for one of those fancy $10,000 a year drugs back then. Um, a book called Cure Your Arthritis. Um, and we were talking, I was in with a bunch of rheumatologists at dinner, we, we couldn't remember a single New York Times bestseller, which this book was, by the way, that ever had the word arthritis in the title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let alone one that made this very bold claim that you could cure arthritis. The idea is that these are building blocks of cartilage. I told you that the thought is the cartilage just wears thin. The natural process every day from when you're a, you know, an infant, when you move the joints, you rub things against each other and you do some damage, the body just comes in and cleans it up. It takes care, gets rid of the rough and old fibers and puts some nice slick new fibers down. And the thought is that as you get older, you get behind in the process. You're tearing up damaged stuff faster than you're rebuilding fresh stuff, and that's why it wears thin. That makes sense. Can't prove it, but it makes good sense. Well, the glucosamine story would be that if you add in extra building blocks, you can build back the cartilage faster and, and make everything good again. And that sold a bucket load of books and pills. Um, gosh, there's some holes in the theory, for instance, um, um, both glucosamine and chondroitin are animal products. In fact, they were originally purified from that for the, for the pills. Um, people who are vegetarian, especially people who are vegan, get none of those building blocks in their diet. They are severely deficient in, in glucosamine and chondroitin in their diet. So they must have terrible arthritis, right? Yeah, they, they, they don't. No. Um, so, so there's some problems with it. Um, but it's been very popular. Um, there were lots of little anecdotal studies carried on by manufacturers selling the pills um, and that said, oh, people get better. Um, and I actually had a very good friend who was an orthopedist in Baltimore who went to an orthopedic meeting that saw this, somebody claiming it worked, and, and told patients, oh, look, what could hurt? You might as well try it. I mean, try it. Um, when the NIH, because the NIH, which is the, 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 government, the United States government's National Institute of Health, it's our funding for medical science research, um, they've been under a lot of pressure to study some of the herbal and natural things because there's just too little information. And, and understand that no professor at this school is going to undertake a big study of, of some Arctic um, lichen until somebody gives them some money to do the study with. I mean, it's not going to happen. And, and, and so there's not a lot of research going on in academics. And so there's pressure on the NIH to fund some academic research into these things. And they funded a big research grant into looking at glucosamine and worn out knees. And the bottom line at the end of the study was no benefit at all. Now, the companies that make it claim, wait a minute, you used the wrong glucosamine, you should have used this other one. Well, sure, but that's not the one that's on the grocery store shelf in 80% of the bottles. So. I'm not sure. I should. And they said, in the study, there was a tiny number of people who had severe worn out knees when they started the study who, who felt like they were better at the end of the study. It was too, too few people to be statistically meaningful, just you know, a handful. But they were better. And again, the people selling the supplements said, that's it. You studied the wrong people. You should have studied people with severe worn out knees, right? I mean, because after all, when you see an ad for this in a magazine or on TV, it always says these are just for people with severe worn out joints, right? I mean, that's, no, it's not. They market it to everybody, and so it, that wouldn't make sense, but it, it, it can't be. In Europe, glucosamine is controlled like other prescription drugs, and it's probably purer and, and better preparations, and there are some small studies there with their preparations that are said to work better, but nobody's repeated those studies here, and I can't tell you that that's true. So it, it's probably good to eat a very good, healthy, well-balanced diet, 
Um, but I can't tell you of any supplement that's going to fix things. Yes? So do you see a relationship between vitamin D and autoimmune diseases? And if so, do you advise supplementing? Um, so vitamin D is, is one of the faddish things. Um, and vitamin D, by the way, is not a vitamin. Vitamin D is a hormone. Um, hormones are chemicals made in one tissue that tell another tissue in your body what to do. There's very little vitamin D in most of our diets. Vitamin D is manufactured in your skin when it's exposed to UV light. And then that vitamin D goes and tells the gut to absorb calcium and the bones to put it to use. And it may do some other things. Vitamin D became a very popular vitamin, much like vitamin E was going to fix everything in the world a few years earlier. Um, and, and it's reputed to do thousands of things for which there is very little research. And, and there probably will never be research because most, all of the vitamins are generic chemicals and nobody's going to make a bucket of money off of, of doing privately funded research with them. And there's some great questions that the NIH could fund, but the NIH gets a million great questions every year and it don't have the money to pay for research into all of them. So we don't see that research get done. Um, there's, there's really an adequate amount of research. I do see up here a ton of people who come in with, with terrible body pain that's often carter arthritis. I've seen people with it called lupus and rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed by a doctor with lupus and rheumatoid who didn't have those diseases but did have severe vitamin D deficiency. Um, if you are severely de vitamin D deficient, you don't absorb calcium from the gut every day, but you do lose naturally calcium through your, your kidneys every day. It's in your urine every single day. It's natural and it belongs there. Um, if it's going out and it's not coming in, then it's dropping and disappearing from the blood. If the blood level dropped low enough, your heart would stop. And, and that's bad. I've read all about that. Um, so you have a mechanism. The, the parathyroids in your body act like a thermostat, and they measure minute to minute the calcium level. And they release their hormone, which says, go to the warehouse and dissolve some calcium. And the warehouse is bones. And, and it's meant to work that way to keep the system balanced, but it's not meant to be left turned on 24-7. In Fairbanks, where there is no UV light from September to May, um, tons of people are deficient in vitamin D. Um, there's actually plenty of it. You, you can get a sunburn here in, in, for a couple months in the summer, but that's not enough to last you for the whole year. And when you're deficient long enough, and, and the people who really get it, two years after they move here, I see young you know, military wives and say, oh, Dr. Wilson, I remember exactly when I got this. I got this in September of 2015. And I know because my daughter started playing soccer in middle, middle school, and I was a bad soccer mom. All the other moms were out on the side of the field cheering their daughters. I'm sitting in my car in the parking lot because I can't walk across that uneven ground between the parking lot and the field. My back would kill me. So I sit in the car and cheer from my car. September of 2015. Oh, when did you move up here? Oh, July of 2013. Two years after they get here, they start to suffer. It doesn't happen immediately. But if you don't absorb calcium every day to replace what's going out, you constantly are dissolving it away from the bone. You dissolve it from the surface of the bone because that's where the little cells on the bone that know how to chew calcium up are. And the, the surface of the bone becomes rough and riddled, and right over top of that surface is a membrane full of nerve endings. It's the one that you kicked your shin against the chair as a kid and said some words you weren't supposed to. Um, that, ner that membrane's full of nerve endings, and right underneath all those nerve endings, the bone is getting crumbly and jagged, and, and, and people start to hurt really bad, and they can't sleep, and then they get sleep deprived and get that other condition, fibromyalgia, which is really not a rheumatology, um, but, but often wind up being seen by rheumatology um, because they're so sleep deprived. And when you fix the vitamin D and the calcium, which unfortunately, once the bone is bad enough to hurt that bad, takes months to get better. You can fix the vitamin D level overnight. There's one Italian study that said you give this just unbelievable amount of cal vitamin D as one dose and the vitamin D level is normal the next day. But that just gets you started back on the path to absorbing a little bit of calcium every day. Calcium is a metal, and like other metals, like gold, um, um, iron, if anybody was ever pregnant and had to take tons of iron pills so you could absorb a tiny amount of what you took, um, or mercury, fortunately, which kids swallow mercury thermometer stuff and don't die of mercury toxicity because the mercury doesn't get absorbed. 
metals are poorly absorbed from the gut, and calcium is too, so it takes a long time to, to absorb enough calcium to repair the damage that was done. Um, so I don't see the immune problem from it, and I don't believe anyone's convincingly showed that vitamin D does cause all the things that it's, it's reputed to do, um, although it certainly could if somebody did the work and, and showed it, but, but it, it's reputed to do so many things, almost certainly most of them it doesn't, but it certainly does cause diffuse body pain that I've seen a lot of up here. Um, I take, when I got off the plane um, my first night in, in Fairbanks, I knew this would be, I almost never saw this kind of stuff in Baltimore, by the way, almost never. Um, we, and nobody, if you go from here to Seattle to, to be worked up for your body pain, they'll never think of this because they never see it down there. Um, even though it's rainy all the time there, you're not as, as deprived as you are here. Um, I got off the plane and, and, and stopped at Fred Meyer and got a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, and a bottle of, of thousand unit vitamin D's. Um, once I saw the first two or three dozen patients with this um, in, in the first couple of months, I got the 5,000 unit pills. And if you do the arithmetic for the, for the inadequate, there is isn't adequate research, there really isn't. Because again, there's no money in doing calcium or vitamin, they're generic chemicals. There's no, nobody's gonna make a profit, nobody's gonna pay for the research. But what has been done, if you look, and do the, do the math for what people have observed, it looks like it would take about 5,000 units a day um, to, to make it through the winter here. Um, the people who are really in pain and need to replace it, I would double that. Um, I've seen a woman who's taken double that dose, takes 10,000 a day for 10 years, and her vitamin D level was perfectly normal, and she was a petite little, you know, 70-year-old. Um, she was not a big person. She was taking 10,000 a day, and it was perfect. Um, you can overdose on vitamin D, but it probably takes a long time and probably more than 10,000 a day. But again, if you do the math, probably 5,000 a day puts most people in the right ballpark. Um, and that's over the counter at every store in town. Um, so yeah, I do that. And, and for a lot of people, you can do, there is a blood test for the vitamin D level. Um, yes? Bee stings, some people do a lot of bee stinging. Um, there's a lot of things that are done um, that, that, that um, like acupuncture. People ask, does acupuncture work? Well, I've got people who tell me it clearly worked for them. Um, it's been around a lot longer than any of the treatments I use, so there's probably a reason why it survived that long. I had a patient, um, a, 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 an older Korean woman who came in who was covered with little, remember, remember at the last Olympics, those, those swimmers that had the red spots on there? The cupping. She had been cupped really severely, and she had scars from the little round circles all over her, her trunk, you know, her back and her, and her belly. Um, and, you know, her daughter swore that for many people they work. So, um, so bee stings are popping among some people. Um, can I tell you a mechanism by which they would actually help? No, no. Um, but plenty of people uh, use them, and, and plenty of uh, bee handlers who've been stung a gazillion times tell them it helps with, you know, everything. So, um, I don't know. I mean, you've been you've been a long time. What do you, what, yeah, I'm yes. already on to a second question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to ask you was, um, since you're on the area of pain management, is have you seen much research lately about the research on placebo effect and how that might be used? Placebo effect. She's asking me about pain management and placebo effect. Yeah. Placebo effect is powerful. Thirty to forty percent of people given a placebo feel better including cancer patients. Cancer patients given placebo do better. Mm -hmm. They still die, but their life experience from the day they started till the day they die is better. Mm -hmm. Less pain, more enjoyment of life, everything is better with placebo. It's a powerful thing. If your brain believes something is going to happen, things happen. And, and the brain is connected to everything, including the immune system. So, so placebo is powerful and works for lots of things. Placebo isn't done, it's done in, in tons of medical clinical trials to get a drug approved or to see what works better than the other drug. Yeah. In my office, it's just unethical for me to give you a sugar pill and, well, and yeah. you know. <laughs> so, so we don't do that. And look, there's plenty of times I'd like to, believe me, because there's plenty of times I, I believe that a placebo would work better than, yeah. than, the, than the medicine somebody wants to yeah. take, but we, don't, we can't and we don't do that. 
Um, and, and so, but, but in clinical trials it's used and it's powerful and it's real. And uh, again, you know, all pain experience is, is through the brain. Um, it, you know, it's this, the picture of the guy who's been through some trauma and his arm looks like, you know, it's been through a meat grinder. Yeah. And, and he's laying there and, and, you know, the ambulance crew's trying to load him on the ass the medic. Oh God, my face. Is that a bad cut? You know, is, is my girlfriend never gonna like me again? I, and, you know, the brain's just turned that off. We don't understand that, um, but, but it's clearly true. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, oh, yes. Um, you said probably eight or nine times tonight that some of the most common perceived benefits are never going to get any research. Like, That's um, true. Clearly, lots of um, uh, medicines that are natural products um, Glucosamine comes right in. Um, it seems to me that the system is so skewed now that profit is the only thing that matters. And you've said that some of these will never get done, but a lot of the profit comes out of work that NIH does, and then the private companies benefit from it by using it and developing it. Sure. Can't we ratchet that balance a little better so that we get research that natural product? I mean, there are people well, who my are answer the heartbeat is. No, we haven't. You know, this, this, this question has been around for a long time. I mean, well, I'm just raising a point. I'm just raising a point. That's where I think the political pressure ought to be applied. My time, and it should mention, in, in, in molecular biology, I, I cloned a mouse on which we have a patent, and, and the, the university makes a little money, and I've gotten a couple of dollars in real royalty checks, not very much. Um, and believe me, I thought at the time, how is it that the, the research work I did was funded by the NIH and th they just step aside and let the university take all the benefits. And the university will sell out and give it to a company who probably was smart enough to only pay for things that they think they can make a hundred times what they paid. Um, but, but like it or not, profit is a powerful motive that gets things done. It, it really is. The NIH funds a lot of science in the name of science, you know, just, but the NIH is under a lot of political pressure and, and, and it's, it's way more effective to get more money into my research study to go out and convince the public that I'm gonna make them all better than it is to try to convince skeptical scientists at the NIH that I've got a great idea. Um, it's easier to convince the lay public and let them convince their politician to put the pressure on the NIH to fund my topic. Um, the NIH very much responds to political pressure and um, they have a limited amount of funds and there are still a gazillion very fascinating questions to ask and they just have a, there's a limit to how much money there is to study it. A private industry that somebody, whether it's actually, you know, most drugs are not developed by big drug companies anymore. They're developed by small biotech companies that get all their funding from venture capitalists and investment bankers who think, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Here's a million dollars, you know, tell me what you can do. And, and they know that most of the time you're gonna come back and say, sorry, all the mice died. My, my. <laughs> and my million dollars is gone, I can't get it back. But the one time it hits, I wanna make profit on, on the million I gave you, plus all the million I gave the people who killed the mice. Um, so, so, that can be a powerful motive to get things done. And, you know, we've made phenomenal process with these drugs that I sort of scoff at charging $40,000 a year. Um, I, I mean, the world is different because of those drugs. Total hip and total knee replacements, those joint replacements I talked about at the beginning, life is different because of that. I grew up in a small town and I can remember walking through town and you know, if your hips or your knees wore out, you had your choice. You got a wheelchair or a rocking chair. And, and I, we'd go downtown with my mother and everybody was rolling around in a wheelchair. Now they're back on the golf course and they're playing tennis and they're, they got a total, the, the price tag has been phenomenal and the technology has been driven forward by companies that are making money off of that technology. Um, and, and it's very different. Life for a person with worn out hips or knees now is a totally different, and even shoulders. You know, losing the use of an arm is pretty disabling. And artificial shoulders are almost as good as hips and knees now. So, so, yeah. Huh? Takes only two days to change your mouth. 
<laughs> it, it's they're very common. It, it's phenomenally exper- expensive. And Medicare pays a gazillion dollars that nobody ever planned for Medicare to have to pay out. But it's changed the life of people who have arthritis. Make the, you know, it's a dramatic improvement in, in life. So I don't know. I mean, the answer would be great. Couldn't we somehow figure out how to take that money back? Couldn't we better apply money? But there's a, I, can, I can list a million things that we spend money on that we could spend it better on. Um, and probably a lot of them aren't even medical. Um, I'm, I'm a little biased, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, we, we don't spend effectively that way. And it's a shame. Yes? Well, in conjunction with the issue that Richard just mentioned, it also is in our country here that the durable medications that are sold, they are not controlled by anyone. And right. So it says on the label it contains whatever it is you think you want, but there is no guarantee that it contains what it says or to the amount you know that it has. Right. And I have read information that states that a lot of these herbal medications may or may not contain any of the things that they say it contains, and the amounts that they. Sure. So she's asking about um, supplements, um, herbal products, natural products that aren't as labeled. Well, first of all, they don't even have to have a label. In, in essence, you know, um, lobbyists for the for the for the herbal industry. Um, took their congressman to Jamaica and over some rum punches convinced them that um, the, the, the FDA was abusing their, their companies that were selling just natural supplements and that they shouldn't have any control of them. And the, the, the you know, supplement, Dietary Supplements Act was, was passed, which says basically they're not regulated. As long as you call yourself a supplement, you don't need to do those testing. Um, and if you made a supplement, um, it would be stupid to test it for purity and content because if you've got a batch that was bad, you'd have to throw it away. If you don't test it, you can go ahead and sell it. Come on. <laughs> what would you do? So, so they aren't tested well, and, 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 and they aren't. Um, glucosamine, um, I, uh, in, in Maryland, I was right down the road from, um, from a company that claimed to sell the very best glucosamine, and he paid to have independent labs test it and showed that some of the generics that were cutting his price to death it had no glucosamine or way less than they were supposed to. Um, and, and that is a problem. Um, in fact, you know, I, I often told people, I, I had a patient come by and ask me, look, you know, will my, prostate, will my prostate medicine interfere with your drugs? And I look at his bottle of prostate, it's called Prostacare or something that he bought at the store. It's not a drug, it's not a prescription drug. And, and I look at the label and it doesn't tell at all what the ingredients are in there. And, and, and I said, look, I know it's probably got salt palmetto because that's really common, and there's all kinds of other things that have been used in prostate preparations, but I have no idea what's in there. If you go over to Fred Meyer and pick up a can of Stokely Van Camp green beans and look at the back, it'll tell you how much um, um, protein and, and, and carbohydrate and fat's in there and salt. And the fat and salt are easy because there was none in the natural green beans. The only fat and salt are what Stokely added to the can. <laughs> but, um, and the other stuff doesn't vary much from, from one strain of green bean to the next. But, it's required on the label that foods have that. Supplements don't. Um, so it's very easy. There was a 60 Minutes story where they took, um, they took a, you know, in, in, in China, I think it was, mainland China, being an herbalist is respected. It's like being a pharmacist in America. And they took um, some Asian uh, media w- workers and went to a Chinese herbalist and requested, you know, 25 grams of lingua and sing- 50 grams of ping fu, and they went and paid for a laboratory to analyze it, and they got exactly what they, what they ordered. Although, I would argue, you have no idea if what you ordered it has what. Nobody would doubt um, that, that um, there, among strains of, of marijuana, and there's marijuana, and there was marijuana. Um, <laughs> nobody would doubt that you can buy a, a, a beautiful red rose and, and some beautiful red roses have no smell at all, and others you can put one in a vase and it, the entire room smells of the, the, the wonderful fragrance. The same plant 
under, grown under different conditions, maybe a slightly different strain, have very different amounts of the chemicals of that plant. So even if you get the genuine herb, you would have no idea if it's got the same amount of whatever the active ingredient in there is until somebody figures out what the active ingredient is. But yeah, so they took this, they, they, they took the stuff from a Chinese herbalist in China and got exactly what they, they took an Asian intern um, from 60 Minutes over to Chinatown in New York and bought um, herbs from, and she got something like 80% of what she asked for, pretty close. They had a Caucasian intern walk into the same shop and order, you know, the next day virtually the same stuff, and he got, um, he got a lot of oregano. Um, <laughs> So, so, and that was one example, but you know, the, the point is without there being a label, without there being testing, yeah, it's true, you don't know what you're getting. And it makes it hard to know, it makes it hard to do a study. Um, in fact, even negative studies, there was a study that came out, you may have heard that cone flowers, echinacea, are good for colds. I mean, it was pushed for a long time. And then, I don't know who did, but somebody did a study a couple years ago and announced, well, echinacea didn't help colds. How would you know? How would you know if you use the right strain of echinacea? Did, you know, there's purple ones and there's white ones. Um, there's some that they're, they're really tall and some that are shorter. How do you know if you use the right echinacea to make such a bland statement? They just don't work. I don't think you can say. So, yeah, that's a problem. Do you recommend changing diet? Um, there are... Again, there are tons of recommended dietary changes, and I've, I've seen patients taking virtually every um, weird diet. Um, some patients seem to get um, dramatic benefits. There are some diets that clearly are bad for some people. Um, gluten, uh, you can't ignore um, because it was another one of the fads. Um, probably a lot more people are gluten allergic than are really gluten allergic. Um, but maybe I'm wrong because when I was a medical student, gluten allergy was limited to just those little kids with failure to thrive. And now we recognize that tons of people have much milder um, gluten disease that, that um, still makes them sick, it's just not as sick as the kids. What's that? They say the nightshade uh, vegetable is caused. They say. Yes. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, <laughs> they, they say a ton of things, and it's very hard to know what's right. It, it, you know, you can try something that works for you. Um, one of the problems with the supplements is, you know, a few years back, and when I was in training, there was a very popular supplement, L-tryptophan. You know, ever do you remember L-tryptophan? Um, L-tryptophan is the amino acid that's in turkey and in chocolate milk or hot and warm milk that makes you go to sleep. So it, was, it started off as a very popular dietary supplement for, um, for sleep. And, and like many, once it was a fad, it didn't just fix insomnia. It also fixed depression and impotence and you name it, people <laughs> took it. And then there was a disease that went around the country called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. Nice name. Eosinophils are the allergic white blood cells that you got, very distinctive immune cells. Um, and these people had way too many of them. Myalgia means your muscles hurt. The people who had this disease literally cried to roll over in bed. They were in so much pain. Their muscles hurt so bad. And nobody had seen this before. It was a new disease, and it was kind of a little mini epidemic, and everybody was scratching their head trying to figure out what it was. And, and, and because, for well, many reasons, but one of them being because you guys are all weasels and won't tell me what you're taking when you come to my office, you know? You take a bunch of supplements and you think I might think you're weird for taking the supplements. So you just don't mention that to me. It's not that bad, but people don't. People don't remember all the prescription drugs they take. So people don't tell the doctor they're taking the L-tryptophan. It took a long time until I believe it was actually a rheumatologist in Utah who said, that's funny, you're the fourth patient I've had with this rare syndrome that told me they were taking L-tryptophan. So he called up the CDC and said, I don't know what to make of this, but, well, the CDC knows what to do. They get on the phone, and they, they track everybody who's been reported to have this disease and say, you know, John Doe in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, Dr. Wilson said, you have eosinophilia. Do you have that? You know. Look, did you ever take um, L-tryptophan? You did. <laughs> and everybody with the disease was taking L-tryptophan. It turns out that it, it's not the L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid in warm turkey. Um, there was virtually one chemical plant in Japan, I think, that made the entire world supply of L-tryptophan, um, and they contaminated a batch. They would make up, you know, a five-ton batch and then put it in two-pound bottles and ship it to all the companies that would then scoop it into pills and sell it to you. Um, and, and they contaminated one batch, and it was the contaminant that caused the problem. 
not the L-tryptophan. Um, and they yanked it off the shelf immediately and the disease disappeared. The people almost all recovered. Some of them had been immobilized for so long, it took them a long time to recover because um, they didn't stop taking their L-tryptophan just because they were in bed. Um, and, and, and so that supplement, which was unregulated, untested for purity, caused problems. Um, a decade later, melatonin took off. Newsweek carried a story about melatonin being the end all for insomnia and it fixed jet lag um, and it just ripped off. There is, a, there is a sort of consumer reports for doctors of drugs um, and they, they said, look, we only normally look at new prescription drugs, but melatonin is so popular, we looked at melatonin and we went out and, and looked at all the research that actually is published and we, we bought a couple dozen bottles at health food stores all over America and we tested it. And we found, like, like other supplements you talk about, some of our 10 milligram, our bottles of 10 milligram melatonin pills had 10 milligram pills in them. Some had 1,000 milligram pills, 100 times the dose. Some had none. And they all said 10 milligrams right on the label. Um, if you were some big executive who was about to fly to Japan for some multi-million dollar meeting for your company, and you depend on getting over there and spending a couple hours of sleep in the hotel and getting in for the meeting, and you take this zero milligram pill and you sleep through the meeting, man, that, wouldn't that just do you in? Um, anyway, um, they, they found vastly different amounts, which is a problem with all the supplements. Um, they also found uh, three bottles that had a contaminant in, in, in the pill that they couldn't identify. They have the formula, they know how to make the stuff. This, by the way, is what was popularized by Doonesbury in the 70s or 80s as the extract of the, the uh, pineal gland of a male iguana. Um, it, it's actually, melatonin is a chemical made in the pineal gland of the brain um, that supposedly regulates sleep, so it's not without merit. Um, and, and they took the, the, the bottles of contaminated pills back to the place they bought it and said, look, you know, Miss Smith, you sold me this bottle of, of um, Jones, um, Jones Health Foods um, melatonin. We tested and found a contaminant. Could you tell us where you got it? You know, we know you didn't make it. And in every case, the, the, the retailer said, oh, no, 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 it's proprietary trade information. As if, if we told you where we bought it, you'd go out and try to undercut us. You'd open a store across the street and sell the same stuff. As if you couldn't open any health food magazine and go to the back and call up one of those companies selling 100 different supplements and order wholesale quantities of those and do that. But they wouldn't tell them. So they went to the company that was the presumed manufacturer who said, oh, you know, gosh, that's interesting, contaminant, huh? Um, gosh, you know, um, I can't tell you if we make this. We make, we make melatonin, but um, we make it and we, we wholesale it out to 100 different companies that repackage it and bottle it. And I couldn't tell you whether we sell to Jones, Jones Health Foods or not. I just don't know, if, you know, liar, liar, pants on fire, there's a lot number on the back of the bottle that you might not know the whole number, but you can figure out if your plant number's in there. Um, but they didn't call them on it, they just said fine. And, and the bottom line was not the people selling it nor the people making it cared what the contaminant, and they said, our scientists are busy. We'd really like to help you figure out what your contaminant is, but we're busy. Um, good luck. Um, if nobody cares, who cares for the, for the, pa for the patient? Um, I, I don't think they ever found out what it was. They didn't show it was toxic or bad. It was just that there is no, inadequate testing of, of the whole field. So I would love to see more testing, and I don't know that that's gonna happen either. Um, yes. <clears throat> My 95-year-old mother gets mm -hmm. rooster comb injections in her knees. Uh -huh. They're a thousand bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. She swears they work. She hasn't paid a thousand dollars for them, I don't think, has she? No, Medicare. What's well, that? You pay for it. Yeah, Medicare yeah. pays a couple hundred for it. Right. So she gets five every six months. Right. And she's still living independently. Mm -hmm. Is it sorcery? No. So, so the lubricant in animal joints is is uh, it's called hyaluronic acid. It's a it's a protein. Um, it's, if you, you know what a bottle brush looks like, the long skinny thing with the bristles that go around the whole, so it looks under the mi electron microscope like a bottle brush, except the bristles are little short chains of sugar, and sugar loves water, so this long stringy thing gets gushy with water. Well, long stringy gushy things are slippery, step on a wet mop. Um, and, and, and that's what animals use to lubricate joints, not oils. Um, so they extract that. The first one came from rooster comb. Now, actually, one of the companies um, cloned the gene for it and just have bacteria growing in those tank car-sized vats pouring out hyaluronic acid all day, and they purify it from that. Um, 
that in some people can be very, very pain relieving of the worn out knees. The, the, and the companies would claim about two thirds of people. I used to tell people half and half because I didn't want them to be um, looking for too much. Under promise, over deliver, um, Disney said. So, so some people clearly benefit, other people get no benefit at all. And the series of shots, the drug itself costs something on the order of about $800 for the series. Um, and uh, Medicare covers it, but they pay me less to give it than I pay to give it, so I quit giving it. Um, what's wrong with that model? Um, but, but there are some places that still give it. And, um, and you know, for a while, uh, you, could, you could sort of float the Medicare loss on what you make on private insurers paying it, but they've all gotten stricter about it, and they now make you jump through hoops to get it approved. So it's out there, it works clearly very well for some people. Um, I don't happen to give it, I used to give it. Um, and, and it really is only approved for knees, it never got beyond knees. Yeah, it's on the knees. Yeah. It's, they're, they bill out 5,000 bucks for it. They yeah, can bill whatever you want, they just don't say it, you know? That's <laughs> great. Um, I have one more question. Okay. If you get very quick and successful relief using prednisone, does that help identify the type of arthritis you have? No. no. Prednisone, unfortunately, is a feel-good drug, and, and, um, and many, many things feel better after prednisone. Um, there was a recent report that even small doses for a short time are bad for people, all kinds of bad things, broken bones, heart attack strokes. They almost bury in the report that the, the population of, of, of people in their study who took prednisone were all people with multiple medical illnesses, multiple comorbidities, they're called, other diseases, um, compared to the people who didn't take prednisone. But um, they got better. There are a couple of diseases that, based on the symptoms, you're very, very strongly suspicious. It's that diagnosis. And you give one prednisone for that, and uh, people are cured overnight. Um, and that is, is almost diagnostic for that disease. But for many other things, many things feel better after a prednisone, and it, it just doesn't help. Not, not enough. All right, is that it? What, wait, one more? Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Is it just the one specific part of the body, or is it other places other than the feet? Gout can affect every joint in the body. Okay. Absolutely. And what where is on gout? So gout is, gout is um, and there's a, a closely related disease called pseudogout, false gout, which is actually calcium crystals. Gout is crystals of uric acid. Uric acid it was found in urine, so it's called uric. It's the recycling product, though, of recycling DNA, nucleic acids. Um, and so diseases where you turn over DNA, tumors that you turn over, cells too often and have too much DNA, gets it. Um, eating lots of red meat is full of DNA, and, and so processing that, you, you make uric acid. People who get gout make more than they can excrete through their kidneys um, in a day, either because they, they make too much because they've got a genetic defect in the enzyme processing that overproduces it, or they eat a lot too much, which is hard but can be done, or their kidneys don't quite keep up with, with nor eliminating a normal amount. Either way, they wind up with too much uric acid in the body. It gets too concentrated and starts to crystallize, not just in joints, all over the body, in every tissue, but it causes real damage in joints. For a bunch of reasons that make biologic sense, it tends to hit the foot first, especially the big toe. But it can be in any joint in the body, and it, after people have had it for years, virtually every joint in the body is affected. And again, I've got medicines that will just get rid of it in a couple of years. It takes about a year to two years in some people, um, and it's gone. All right. Wait, one more question in the back. Yes? Yeah, Mr. Quigney, could you just speak for a minute about fish oil? Uh-huh. Fish oil. Right. Um, Does it do it? Is it worth it? Um, it is delicious, <laughs> in salmon especially. <laughs> um, so fish oil. So fish oil is one of those supplement things. Um, it is, um, I will grant that I think there's evidence that humans have historically eaten a ton more fish than we eat now, most humans. Um, and there are a lot of the benefits of fish oil um, may explain why some of the people who did that were healthier. So there's a lot of other habits that go with not eating as much fish too. Um, you eat more McDonald's um, cheeseburgers and fries. 
Um, so so it, it may not be a pure story. But um, in multiple studies trying to look at fish oil supplements and, um, and the specific fatty acids that, that we think make fish oil better, um, we've never shown a health benefit. Not lowered heart attacks, not lowered cancer, not... It, so so it, it, it's hard to say. Um, that said, I think, again, there's evidence humans just used to eat a lot more fish than we eat now, and probably it's healthy, and um, it may be worth it for a supplement, but no one's been able to show that. Okay. Thank you.